Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gorebski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you've been following along this month, we have been celebrating uh, forests and trees, talking to different scientists, explorers, and conservationists from all over the world, learning about why they're so important and some of the important research that they're doing. So before we meet Maria today, we're going to take a moment to share National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive and get a feel for where our groups are joining us live from today. So just bear with me for one moment while I share my screen. There we go. And you should see a map pop up now. So this is me. I am in Alora, Ontario here in Canada. And if we start to back up a little bit more, you can see we've got some classrooms pretty close to me today, one in Elmira and one in Brampton. So not too far away. And if we back out a little bit further, the rest of our classrooms will come into focus. We've got a classroom joining us in Wisconsin, New Jersey, uh, Delaware, Virginia, as well as um, Kansas today. So we've got a great group of classrooms from different spots in North America. And then we've got some pine trees down here to represent Maria joining us uh, in Florida. So I thought that was very appropriate. Um, so as I come back from the screen here, um, as I come back from the screen here, uh, any uh, class who are tuning in live, any class who are tuning in live, live, let's see if I can find where that's coming. Uh, let's see if I can, there I got him. So okay. he's changed. Just a reminder to end questions for tuning in live. You can tune in live action by using the YouTube chat sidebar on the right. Uh, let us know where you're watching from and uh, send us in some questions. And then any classrooms who are tuning in live, whether on camera or YouTube, use Twitter, send us some pictures, use the handle uh, at NatGeoEducation and hashtag Explore Classroom because we'd love to see pictures of classrooms in action. So. We are hanging out today with Maria Fadiman. So Maria's research focuses on ethnobotany, so the study of relationships between people and plants. She works mostly in rural areas with indigenous peoples, as well as subsistence agriculturalists. The majority of her research is in the rainforests of Latin America, mostly in Ecuador, but projects have included researching oil exploration in the Amazon, organic coffee production in the Galapagos, and mine weavers in the Yucatan. She's explored tree poaching in national parks in Africa, house construction from natural materials in the Philippines, and studied Maori uh, utilization of the cowrie tree in New Zealand. So Maria, it is so great to be able to steal some of your time today. We're excited to learn more about what you do. And of course, we're gonna fire away with some questions afterwards. Terrific. Well, I am super excited to talk to you all. Thank you all of you for taking the time to be here. So, um, so I love trees and I love talking about them and getting people excited. So I'm going to share with you some of the stuff that I do with them. And then I'm excited to hear from you guys. So Joe, now should I flip over to the screen? Doodly, to the yeah, I'll let you know when it gets full screen. Okay. The share, do this, do this. We are in business. All right. Okay. All right. So trees and um, what I work with are trees and people. So looking into how this happens, as Joe said, I'm an ethnobotanist. And when you say you're an ethnobotanist, people usually have no idea what you're talking about. So I'm gonna give some examples and starting with the Amazon. And so ethno, that is study of people. And then botany, you have plants. So ethnobotany is the relationship between people and plants. And this can take all kinds of forms. You can be using plants for fiber, for food, for construction, for medicine, or ritualistic uses. And when I talk about rituals, people say, oh, you have to go out to the Amazon to do that. And actually, you don't. We do these things right here. So if you think at the end of October, there's a special plant that we all put out in front of our doors, and it's big, and it's round, and it's orange. And I'm sure you're all thinking, oh, that's a pumpkin. Yes. And then you think, what do we do with a pumpkin? Well, we know what we do. We carve it, and then we put something special inside of it. We put a candle, and then we put it outside our door. 
So we have these glowing pumpkin plants outside of our doors, and that's very ritualistic, and that's very us. And if I said, oh, I work in the Amazon, so this year I'm going to carve a zucchini, and it's going to be a snake. Woohoo! And we don't do that. It has to be a pumpkin, and we know that. So we are very ritualistically connected to plants here as well. And then there are some uses that are a little hard to categorize. When I work out in the rainforest and I work with villagers, often after I have worked with them, they will give me a little present to take home back to the station. So once it was a banana, and that was great. Once it was a raw egg, that was hard to carry. And one family, after I'd worked with them for a long time, and they were really excited. They said, we have a present for you. That's incredible. I was like, ooh. And they came out with a duck. Bah, bah, bah. And I thought, oh my gosh, um, I've always really needed a duck. You know, wow, thank you. And so I'm walking away with the duck, you know, gracias, gracias, and the duck, bah, bah, bah. and I know there is no way I can walk back to the station through the mud for eight hours carrying this duck. But the person who was leading me out there, Don Felipe, he said, oh, I've got this. And he pulled a leaf from a tree and he pulled a vine off of another tree. And he wrapped up that duck and tied it up into a little papoose. So the picture that you guys are seeing now, that is the duck all wrapped up. And then he hung it on the back of his backpack and I walked behind him so the duck was facing me. And so for eight hours, I walked face to face with this duck. <laughs> But that's ethnobotany. That's looking at ways of how to use plants. So there's other kind of plants that we're all really connected to. This one's very common in the United States. Um, I'm actually in Mexico here when I was living with a family. But if you look, what this is, is it's corn. And the grandmother that you see bent over, she takes two dried um, corn cobs and she rubs them together and all the corn kernels fall off and then she collects them which is what you see at her feet to take to the tortilla to make tortillas but if you'll notice uh, somebody is hiding back there and as soon as the grandmother walks away Wah! so this is jose and he can't wait to jump and roll around in the corn so the next time you eat a tortilla just think of a sweaty little boy rolling in your corn. Mm. But going back to the rainforest, how did I get interested in the rainforest in the first place? The first time I went, they told me to be very careful. There are snakes and they're poisonous. Don't reach under anything. Scorpions will get you. And spiders? Spiders are everywhere. And I have to admit to you guys, I appreciate the role they play in the ecosystem, but I don't love spiders. So the first night, I was terrified. I went back to my room and I made a calendar in my head and I counted out the days till when I could go home because I thought, I, I think I hate the rainforest. And that didn't end up happening. I began to learn of the animals and the water and the birds and the snakes and even the spiders, how they all work together. And in the light of day and the more I understood, it wasn't frightening. I had to be careful but I fell in love with the rainforest and now have been working there for years and years and years. And I also realized that there were people and these were the ones who were teaching me their knowledge. They taught me to fall in love with the rainforest and how to use it. I realized people are part of the ecosystem. If I'm going to care about conservation of the forest, I have to care about the conservation of the people who live in it and look at it as a complete package. Ah! So it didn't mean that there weren't still the things I didn't like. So everyone's looking at this and you're thinking, whoa, supersonic spider, those of you who are thinking tarantula. So when you're out in the forest, there's a lot of acting cool and being tough. And as I've told you, I don't particularly love spiders. So this huge tarantula actually fell out of a tree and we're all taking pictures of it and I'm pretending like I'm not scared. And we realize what we need to have in our photos is something to show the scale, something that's a size that we recognize so that when it's next to the spider, you will know how big this tarantula is. So someone says, how about a pencil? I'm like, yeah, good idea, we all know what a pencil 
the size of a pencil. And so someone says to me, why don't you put the pencil by the spider? I was like, <laughs> no way, you put the pencil by the spider. So we all did this and then finally I took the pencil and I threw it towards her and she, whoom, pencil attack. And she jumped on that pencil. We all jumped back. Uh, uh. And then we all remembered we were supposed to act cool. So we started taking pictures. And then someone said to me, um, so we need to get the pencil back. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not getting the pencil back. You get the pencil back. So as you can imagine, we did this for a while. And then we're all conservationists. We don't agree with litter. And I'm just going to let you all know that we left the pencil right there. Yeah. So my first ethnobotanical project, when I began to see the power of trees and the importance of saving them and what people know about them, I was with a group of Guayami in Costa Rica in the rainforest. They're an indigenous group. And there was one woman they called La Enfermita, the little sick one. And she would walk around with crunched over holding her stomach. And one day the village got it together enough money to get her a doctor's appointment in town with a Western doctor. So a group of them walked out of the village and they walked out of the forest through the fields to the town. The rest of us waited at the village. And at the end of the day, the group came walking up and La Enfermita was standing up straight with a smile. And she said to me, Maria, I'm cured. I said, oh, that's great. And she said, the doctor gave me medicine. And she opened her hands and there in a crumpled plastic bag were six Advil. Advil's a painkiller that was gonna make her feel good for a day or two, she wasn't cured. And I didn't know what to say to her because I knew she was excited. And I started to walk away and her sister ran after me. And she said to me, my father knew how to cure from the trees, but we don't know anymore. So part of what I do is recording information so it's not lost, so people remember how to use the trees. We use what we understand and we value what we use. So through keeping the knowledge alive, on how do you make medicine from the trees? How do you use the trees to weave something? It gives you more incentive to want to protect that forest in which those trees grow. And, and looking at trees, here's an awesome tree. This is in the rainforest, and it's got buttress roots. And some of you probably know what these are. If you don't, the soil in the rainforest is good for only about a foot. All of that living, breathing matter, that is all above ground. So for these huge trees, they can't have deep roots because there isn't soil down there for them. So these buttress roots are these huge roots that come up on top of the ground, and these are helping support the tree. So that's the scientific explanation of what the buttress roots are doing. But it also shows some of the ways that they use trees. So we think, oh, well, they use it for medicine. They take something physical. But there's other levels of use as well. So I was with an indigenous person in the rainforest with one of the Kichwa. And he brought us to literally stand amongst the roots. So if you imagine, I'm, take, I'm standing next to these roots and I'm taking the picture up the tree where you guys are looking. And as we're being basically hugged by this tree, the man says to us, when you're lost in the forest, the seba, this is the kind of tree it is, brings you home. And he didn't mean that the tree was gonna tell us how to get home, but he said, if you stand in the roots, just let the tree calm you down you'll be able to figure out ways to go home. So there are all kinds of uses of trees and getting again this cultural connection, not just physical. So how, how do we do this? How do we keep this knowledge of trees alive? So we're now leaving the rainforest. There I am clearly trying to blend in with the indigenous people, which will never quite happen. But one example is doing educational projects. So this is an abaco in the Bahamas. And I had always thought the Bahamas was just a place to go vacation with beaches, but it has forests. So we're with a group and you can see they're all rubbing leaves on themselves. This is the soap leaf. So they're all getting themselves clean with a leaf that we're teaching them about the trees. 
And as you can see, they're all into it. They're rubbing the leaves. They're, uh, they're, they're connecting with this. And just quickly to mention, Kenny Broad is the person with whom I was doing this project and a whole team of people. But you can see it's not always simple. Like some of them uh, were not so into it. Some were really not into it. So part of our work is to get younger people excited about this because that's how you keep knowledge alive. So then we look at why are trees so important? I mean, there's so many reasons, but we're just gonna use an example of one for habitat. So this is a picture, I am in Africa. I am in the country of Tanzania and I'm at a national park and it's Gombe. And what is particularly exciting about Gombe is this is where Jane Goodall, she did her research with the chimpanzees. So I was doing some research in a village called Bubango, which is over this hill. And I am in the park looking over towards Bubango. And we are here to look at the plants. And they said, well, we're going to have you see chimps for sure. So we're hiking and hiking and hiking. And then we're hiking and hiking. And then it's another hour. And I am so hot. And I'm so thirsty. And then we hike some more. And they said, well, make sure you see chimps. And I thought, I don't really care if I see a chimp. I'm tired. I would just like to lie down and have a glass of water. And then one more hour of hiking, and out of the forest comes 14 huge, beautiful brown chimpanzees. And I can't believe I didn't care if I was going to see chimpanzees. It gave me the chills, gives me the chills now when I talk about it. And at one point, this one turned around and she looked at me. And I thought, oh my gosh. I am the chimp whisperer. And she got up and she started to walk towards me. And the rules are you can't go towards them, but if they come to you, it's okay. And I thought, this is it. And she came towards me and she reached down and she picked up a huge rock and she threw it at my head. Whoa! And I was like, oh! And then the, the, the guards that were there, they said, oh, oh, yeah, don't, don't look them in the eye. They don't like that. I was like, okay, great. I'll, I'll keep that in mind for next time. So it's a habitat for chimps. And, and as we said, we're trying to get really kids, students involved and excited. So how do we get them more into it? And we want it to be lasting. So there's a quote. When an older elder dies, a library burns. So all of their knowledge dies with them, all of their knowledge of the trees, like what happened with the Guayami in the rainforest. And we thought, we should build a library. But that's a really big endeavor. So we actually decided, let's make a booklet of their information so they have a lasting, tangible record of what they know. And this is something I did with Grace Gabo, and she's another National Geographic explorer as well. So what kind of trees? There's the baobab. Oh my gosh, this huge, incredible tree. And you say, okay, that looks kind of big. And for all of you have heard the, the term tree hugger, well, hello. Right. So there's Maria hugging a tree and it gives you a sense of the size. So the baobab tree is incredibly important to the people who live in Africa. At one point, there was a child who was crying. And I was walking around with someone who uses plants for healing. Um, and we walked in and the child was crying and crying and he stopped and he said, I know what to do. And he took me outside and we went to this tree, which has very fibrous bark. And we pulled mm -hmm. some of the bark off and wove it into a braid. And he came back in and he tied that around the child's neck. And he said, the baobab will cure the child. Now I have to be honest, the child didn't stop crying, so I don't know. But the point is, when we're looking again at this cultural connection to trees and how that can inspire people to want to keep them safe. Now, there's other uses. Here's another baobab. And if you see it as honey spikes, and these are called honey spikes because these are used to climb the tree and then they will collect honey. And the people who are collecting honey in this situation are the Hadza. This is a hunting and gathering group in Africa. And what she is doing is she is grounding baobab seeds. So that big tree has these fruits and the seeds and they grind them up. She's pounding them with a rock 
and that will be made into flour. But there's also this powdery flesh that you can eat from the baobab. And you can see there she is eating that, wearing as much as she's eating, it appears. And as you can see, everybody likes to eat the baobab. And so as you can see in this picture, kids are into trees, even if he doesn't know at this point from where that delicious thing he's licking from the pot came. So we want the next generation involved. These are the ones who can carry on the traditions of their elders. And we see that, whoop, sorry, y'all, got some funny stuff coming up. The peekers, so we're interviewing elders and kids are excited. They're listening and peeking and some are super curious. And this is what we want. We want them to care about what we're learning because it's their information and we're working with the community to facilitate their own recording of their knowledge. And eventually we make this book, this booklet of the useful plants. And one of the important things is the first language that we use is Kiha. That's the traditional tribal language. We wanna support people with their own knowledge and their own language and their own traditions. And as you can see, kids are interested. That's they, they're seeing their elders' words in print. They're seeing people they know and the trees they know. So this is working. And of course, as we started off with, the trees go beyond people. Home for the animals. So these are monkeys, not be chimps. And looking at this, there are also trees. So these are examples from faraway places, but there's also some um, that come a little closer. So this is a little video that National Geographic made. And um, it takes, right now I live in Florida, so you'll see where it takes you to some information about a tree that's common here. Life science can mean many different things, from the study of plants to the study of people and their environment. Ethnobotany is the study of people and plants together. Maria Fadiman is an ethnobotanist. It is a big word. I tell people I'm an ethnobotanist, and they look at me and they don't have any idea how to react. Ethnobotany is the relationship between people and plants. So it's really how people and plants interact in all sorts of ways. I spent a lot of time in the rainforest in Latin America. That's where I've done the majority of my research. Sometime in the savannas in Africa, I go out to the rainforest and I work with indigenous people who live their whole life connected to plants. And I'll go out and I'll talk to the people about how they use plants. And then they will take me out into the forest and they'll show me the plants that they use so we have this sense of how these people are using using their plants. I'm here in South Florida and I'm surrounded by saw palmettos. People have been using these for thousands of years for so many reasons. Indigenous people have used these leaves for many things. You can see how big and flat it is. You can lay it down and indigenous people would use it as bedding. And if you take it and you cut it off here, and you stack them up on top of each other, that will keep you protected from the rain. Okay, you can see the big long stem here. With this, they would chop into little tiny pieces and then lay it out to dry, and then it would turn into flour. They could use this for baking and for making food. If you reach way down in here, and pull out these fibers. There's lots and they're thin and they're long. And one of the things that people would do with them, they would twist them into rope. And we know that people around here were using a saw palmetto to make rope to use for all kinds of things. So all these uses all come from one plant, the saw palmetto. There's still so much that we don't know about plants. So it's important to conserve these plants so that we can study them. I always wanted to be outdoors and in the trees 
and I always wanted to do conservation. When I was little, we used to go to a summer camp where our beds used to hang in the trees, and you would climb up into your bed, you'd look up at night, and it would just be branches above you, and I loved that. And now I get to work with people who live like that all the time. Ethnobotanists like Dr. Maria Fadiman are learning new lessons all the time about the ways people use and depend on plants. This work can lead to new foods and new medicines for people across the globe. Okay, so we see that, something that was in Florida, now going to China. Few last examples, this is the red bean tree and it's covered in all those cloths. What's going on? And each cloth there's written, there are words that are written. And what these are wishes and prayers. And people have thrown them up into the tree and they've tied them to the tree and they've tied them to the fence in front and they feel that the tree is going to help them get those wishes and prayers. And then in, there's the Kauri tree. In New Zealand, which is incredibly important to the Maori people. They use it for wood, for resin, and for spiritual purposes. So for this man, this is incredibly important. These are redwood trees, which you just saw. There I was in summer camp. This was my view. I'm originally from California, so I'm really connected to these trees because they grow where I grew up. We all connect to where we live. And we saw these examples from across the globe, but we all have trees where we are. I mean, maybe there's a good one for climbing or it gives you shade or it's fruit or it's beautiful or whatever. So it's great if we all take a moment and think of our own worlds and think of a tree that's important to you. Okay, thank you. All right, Maria, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, Really good perspective on looking at the plants around us and the trees around us a little bit more and just thinking about the roles that they play in our life. So thanks for sharing your adventures, but also some of your knowledge about uh, the trees and plants around us. So Maria, if you hit that green button one more time, that'll bring you back to us. Oh, my, my lack of technology skills. I can roam around the forest, but you know, press a button. Oh, hello. <laughs> That's okay. Awesome. You're back. Hello. Uh, perfect. Well, I think it's time we meet some of our classrooms and let them fire away. Great. All right, so let's get started. Let us go first. We're gonna go to um, Mrs. Coronado's group. They are grade fives hanging out with us uh, in Wisconsin. So let me get their microphone turned on. Uh, in Wisconsin. Are we doing grade five? Hello. Hello. Are we doing grade five? Hi there. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much, this is such a privilege. Um, we're a dual language classroom in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and very interested in learning a little bit about the languages you speak. I've had a lot of questions regarding how many languages you speak and how, how did you learn those languages? Great question. So your dual language, and just let me ask you guys, so your dual language with? So your dual language, and just let me ask you guys, your dual language with? Spanish. Spanish. Bueno, Spanish. Encantada hablar con ustedes. Spanish. Bueno. <laughs> that I speak is so so clearly English, and then I speak Spanish. And I learned Spanish because I grew up in California, and you guys are in Wisconsin, and really throughout the United States, so many people speak Spanish where I live that I thought, I want to be able to talk to the people just where I live. So I, the first time I learned any Spanish was in high school. And then going out into these communities, I got a chance to practice and practice. I often, the very first time I went to Costa Rica and I was with a family and we sat down and I could speak Spanish pretty well and a little too quickly. And hola, me llamo Maria, que tal, que bien, encantada conocerte. And then they would respond to me just as quickly and I had no idea what they were saying. So it was a learning process, but now through years and years of working out there, and taking classes in high school and in college, I, I learned Spanish. And so then from there, I also always try to learn some of the indigenous language where I go. So when I'm out in the rainforest, some people speak Spanish, but mostly they'll speak an indigenous language. So I will often sit with the kids, they're great, and they will start to teach me. I'll learn how to say hand and nose and eye and water. And we get some nouns 
and then I write them down phonetically, so how it looks to me, and then I go through those lists over and over again, and it gives me a little bit of a way to talk with them. I, I When I was in Africa, I was learning as much Swahili as I could, and, and there I could I could get it. I could get by, but in general, um, I also use a lot of hand motions and things like that. But I always try to learn some of the language because language is really important to to all of us, to all of our identity. It very much carries who we are. So it's awesome. You guys already have got two languages. Good for you. All right, great question to start us off. Let's take a trip now to New Jersey. We're going to go and hang out with Mrs. Crusoe's Great Force. They're in Marlton. Let's get their okay. microphone turned on and see how they're doing. How are we doing, Great Force? Uh, Hi, my name is Mia, and I was wondering if you read the book Wish Tree because we have a connection with the red, with the red bean, 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 bean trees bean. in China. And making wishes. Hold up the book. And making wishes. No. Well, that is a wonderful book. I have not read it, but I have just, I'm writing it down right now. And what I love about that is that something that's far away in China and you think, oh, they're so different. Look at what they're doing. But you guys have a book that is probably saying a really similar thing. So in so many ways, we're different and it's cool and it's exciting. And in so many ways, we are all the same. So thank you very much for telling me about the wish tree. and. Um, that's on my list to get. Yay! Bring cat watch! All right, very cool. Um, I want to give a shout out to Miss Norris's grade um, grade eights. They are joining us uh, via YouTube, and they are in Colorado. And Maria, they're wondering, what's your favorite tree and why? What is my favorite tree and why? Well, that's a great question. So for, for Colorado, I, I lived a winter in Colorado, so I have a place in my heart for Colorado and hiking there. I would hate to say I have a favorite tree. I love them all. The redwood tree is the one I'm most connected to. And, and as you saw in the video, when I am hanging with my bed, literally we would climb up our own trees and there would be a bed with a mattress. It was a long time ago. They let you do things you couldn't do now. And when I would be laying right snuggled up next to the redwood tree looking up, um, they're tall and they're magnificent and there's a whole world under there that makes you feel really different because very few other things can grow underneath them because of their shade. So it's this really magical, mystical world below. So if I had to pick a favorite, that's what I would pick. All right, good choice. Uh, let's see. Let's go now to uh, Mrs. Miller's class. They are hanging out with us in Brampton, Ontario, so not too far from me, some grade fives. And then Mrs. Miller, uh, with all the groups in today, your microphone is just off of my screen. Do you mind turning it on and saying hi for us? There, we go. there they are. Hey, grade fives. What is, what, is, yeah. what is tree poaching? Yes. Okay, really good question. I didn't know that word either. So when we think of poaching, we usually think of it in terms of, of what? We poach something, it would be, so usually animals. We think of, when I think of poaching, I think of poaching animals, which means you're killing them and harvesting them illegally. So in Africa, there's a big problem with poaching. And I had never thought of it in terms of trees, but there are trees that they use for carving. And you can take a whole tree and you make a huge, big giraffe and you sell it for a lot of money. So a lot of people then poach the trees. They illegally cut certain trees to make these big giraffes. So I was working with ways for people to make smaller items from the branches you cut a branch, you carve little items, and then the tree continues to live. You carve enough items, you earn the same amount, but the big difference is your tree stays living and you can carve from that tree for the rest of your life. So the idea is to stop the tree poaching, which going back to the original question, the illegal cutting of, of certain trees. All right, question. awesome question. Definitely they were paying attention at the beginning. <laughs> 
Really? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let us go now. Uh, Mrs. Saunders, grade fives are hanging out in Delaware with us. Let me get their microphone turned on. Oh, I think you might have to do it for me, Mrs. Saunders, because uh, you joined in on the, the second computer, the Chromebook. So if you want to unmute for me and say, hey. There we go. Hey, Delaware. Uh, Hi, Delaware. Uh, I change it? <laughs> All right. Who's got a question? Yeah. Have you ever saved somebody's life using a plant? Ah, what a wonderful question. Have I ever saved somebody's life using a plant? I have met people. So shamans are uh, healers out in the Amazon or witch doctors, they sometimes call them in Africa. And these people have saved people's lives with plants in terms of medicines. However, as a medicine, I personally have not. But the way I see my work is when I'm working with people's use of plants and getting them excited about their own plants, about their own shamans and witch doctors, and all these different things you can do with plants, that they then want to save the plants that they're using, which saves the forest in which they're living, which gives them a place to continue to have their livelihood. So in that way, I feel like I've saved all kinds of lives. And then I know it's totally not as dramatic as it would have been cool if I'd like given someone a tincture. Um, but also, and again, just to make it all so, what we hear so often, but those trees, we all breathe the oxygen. So for all of us, it's saving lives. But there are people who do. They make little medicines and they do save other people's lives. So it's a good question. All right. So I want to give a shout out to um, Mrs. Taylor's class. They're in Hayes, Virginia. They're grade five students. Their mic's not cooperating. But if you guys wave like crazy, we can see you in the camera. There they are. All right. So don't forget to, to email me a question or two and I'll make sure that uh, we work those questions in. But I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge you guys uh, on camera. Uh, let's see, Mrs. Stegall's group, we haven't visited them yet. There are third graders hanging out with us in Kansas. So right. just need you to help me out today and turn the microphone on for me. I think you might be on an iPad or a Chromebook, which can make controlling the microphones tricky. So if you don't mind turning on the microphone and say hi, and then we'll steal a question. Uh, well, I think I hear them. Hey, Kansas. Hi. Hi, Kansas. All right, Aiden, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, my name is Aiden, and um, are there any? No, Aiden, be louder. <laughs> look at the look at the iPad because that's what the sound is. Go. Are there any countries that you want to visit? Are there any there countries any that I want to visit? Yes, that you haven't been to. That haven't been. Oh, that is such a good question. Yes, where I really would love to go to is Australia. So I have never been to Australia and they have the Aboriginal groups there and they've had a bit of a tough time with um, other countries coming in and living in their country, but they're also getting more rights now. And there's a huge rock there, Ayers Rock, and it has natural stuff living around it. And I would love to go to this place and talk with the, the, um, the native peoples who are from Australia. So I have never been in. Okay, so I'd love to see a koala. Ah, right. <laughs> All Excellent. right, fair enough. I have been out there to the Red Center. and It's beautiful. But ah. I wasn't paying enough attention to the plants. So <laughs> for that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, I just want to check my email really quickly to see if there's any questions have come in from um our other class yet. I don't see anything yet. So we will jump back and we'll try to visit a couple more classes. I think we have time for another question or two. So uh, Mrs. Coronado's group, if you guys have another question, microphone's on. Uh, Mrs. Coronado's group, if you guys have another question, microphone's on. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Hi. My yeah. name is... Yeah. Hola. Hi. Hi. My name Hola. is... Hola, mi nombre es Yair. <laughs> Mucho gusto. Uh, <laughs> Mucho gusto. Um, 
Kato, I want to know what did you study? Because I want to be a explorer when I grow up. Ah, what did I study? That's a great question. So I always wanted to save the world, which was a bit of a large undertaking. And I love to read books. I love to read novels. So I wanted to be an English major. All of the English classes were full. And so instead I did Latin American literature. So I read in college um, novels and books and writings from Latin America. And through this, I still wanted to save the world, but I was afraid of math and science. I thought I couldn't do that. And so for my, um, my undergraduate thesis in college, I wrote about how trees and plants are represented in Mayan myths because I was using literature, which I understood. And then I realized when I was out in the rainforest that time and those people from those pictures, that indigenous man who um, with the feathers, when they were showing me the forest and teaching me how it worked, I realized, oh my gosh, it's, it's pollination, it's photosynthesis, it's all of these things and I can do science. This is science, this is awesome. So I went to graduate school and that's when I started to do my botany and my biology. And I also did anthropology. So I was looking at culture and looking at plants. And I ended up getting my doctorate, my PhD in geography, which I could do the culture and I could do the plants. I could do relationship of people and the land. But what I would take away from that, that's what I studied, but I didn't start off wanting to be an ethnobotanist. I didn't even know what the word was. So I really, I was following my passion. And my passion at first was reading literature and it through that it got me here. So you asked what I studied, but I can't help give a little advice, is really to follow what, what gets you excited and what you're into. And you can, you can find ways to make that work for what your dream is of what you wanna be. All right, awesome advice. You've gotta be curious and check things out, find answers and yeah, that's what explorers do. <laughs> All right. Well, Maria, I'm going to hit you with a two-part question for our final mm -hmm. question today. Okay. The first part of it comes from our group who is joining us um, in Hayes, Virginia. They sent me a question, okay. and they're wondering, um, well, first they're saying they love your talk, and then they're <laughs> also wondering the environment that you visited with the most biodiversity. And then the second part of the question comes from a group in Hoover, Alabama online, how can we protect trees in our own communities? How can we conserve trees? Great questions. Okay, so the place I went with the most biodiversity, that would be the Amazon rainforest. I mean, we hear about if you take a small plot, you will find so many different plants all in, the, in that little area. And then you'll go to another area, you'll find a whole other side. So biodiversity, just the, the, the most number of plants and the smallest area was definitely in the rainforest and I worked so hard to learn those plants and I would go every day and I would go out with shamans and curanderos and I never ever ever learned them all so there's a lot to be done there and what can we do so from Alabama to protect the trees in our own area I love that that's the question and that's something that we all need to think about wherever we are so there's all kinds of ways one is I'm, I'm a big proponent of planting trees Feels simple, but that's huge. You plant a tree, you now have a new tree, and you're also connected to that tree. And I would also look around at the trees that you already care about. Maybe they're in a park, maybe they're in your yard, and devote yourself to making sure that that tree stays standing and that you are connected and that matters. And then there's larger things. Absolutely, you guys get together, write letters, make appointments to talk to local governments about what's important to you and what you want and you don't vote yet, but you will. And that is how you get your voices heard of what's important to you. So definitely put that out. But And the biggest thing, when I was doing this, and I want to save the world, and that, that's too much, but even with saving these forests, as I thought, oh, I can't do it all. And I can't. But as my, my mother said to me once, when I was younger, I was around your all's age, and I we had a guava tree, these little fruits. And I went around the neighborhood, and I sold guavas for a nickel a piece I had to send that money to Greenpeace. And at the end, I had like a dollar ten. And I had a dollar ten, and my mother was writing a check out to send to Greenpeace for my dollar ten. And, and I was disappointed. I knew that wasn't very much money. 
And my mother said to me something that I've remembered, and I'm quoting it almost exactly, that Gandhi, who's a whole other issue, but a very powerful person in, in India um, who really changed a whole country. And he said, whatever you do may seem insignificant, but it's important that you do it. And that is what I carry with me every day when I go out into the forest. So whatever you guys do, that that is important and own it. All right, that is awesome advice, Maria. Thank you so much. Um, 45 minutes go so fast. I wish we could just keep firing <laughs> questions at you. But on Twitter, would you mind if the classrooms had more questions, if they sent some questions to you via Twitter, tweet it at you? Sure. Okay. Absolutely, I would love that. I think it's just at Maria Fadiman. I think so. <laughs> I'm not okay. sure. I, did. I have a Twitter account. All right, I did send uh, your handle via the initial email. So uh, classrooms, if you do have more questions, please feel free to fire away. And Maria, I have to say thank you so much. That was great. I know the classrooms enjoyed hanging out. Uh, the student questions were awesome as always. Uh, so thank you so much for spending a little time with us today. Well, thank you, Joe, for organizing this. And thanks all of you guys, great questions. Super oh. excited to talk to you. All right, well, before we sign off, two quick reminders. Don't forget, if you took some pictures, post them on Twitter, tag at Nat Geo Education and hashtag Explore Classroom. And then if you want some more adventure looking at trees and rainforest, tomorrow we connect with Nurupa Rowe. She's a explorer in India, and she's gonna talk about all the really cool things she sees in the rainforest there, as well as how she draws them and makes botanical drawings. So tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern, we might even still have a camera spot or two. So if any classrooms wanna hang out, send me a message. Maria, enjoy the rest of your day. Classrooms, enjoy the rest of your day. Let me turn on the microphones. Okay, classrooms, nice classrooms, and water. Thank you. 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 Thank you.